welcome back. I'm Silicon Thaumaturgy, and today we are going to deep dive into samplers in stable diffusion. At the time of this video, there are a whopping 22 samplers, which can be horribly confusing, especially to new users. So, I'm going to break down what is different between them so you can pick out the best samplers for you. As my longtime viewers might know, my first video also covered samplers. But this is not just a remaster with those three new samplers shoehorned in. We will also cover what changes with SDXL and what all those weird things like Ada and Sigma Churn do. As always, there are bookmarks in the video description, so feel free to use them to get the information you want. Let's start out with the easiest development to explain, SDXL. There are two important differences. The first is that three samplers, DDIM, PLMS, and UDPC cannot be used with SDXL. The second important difference is that Euler A outputs look foggy and less sharp for SDXL, which is important because Euler A is the default sampler for Automatic 1111. There are a few other minor changes, but I will call those out in the applicable section. Everything else applies to SD 1.5 and SDXL equally. Since Comfy UI is very popular right now, here's a chart showing how the sampler names in Comfy UI correspond to Automatic 1111. Overall, it's pretty straightforward, except Comfy does not have Keras versions. Instead, Keras is defined by the noise scheduling. But enough trivia, let's move on to something more concrete. The first important parameter is processing speed. Basically, how much computing power does it take to execute a single step? For this, there are only two groups, fast and slow, with DPM Adaptive as the single outlier. The slow samplers take twice as long per step compared to the fast samplers. Pretty simple, right? The processing speed for DPM Adaptive depends on the CFG, with higher CFGs requiring more time to complete. Next, let's talk about convergence. And by convergence, I mean whether or not the output image changes substantially if you add more steps. For converging samplers, the image does not change much once it reaches a particular output. Little details can change, but the overall image is pretty set. This is because most of these samplers do not add noise back in to latent image during generation. I was considering adding a partial convergence category for samplers with SD in their name. These samplers, especially the non-Keras versions, tend to change a little bit more than the rest of the converging samplers. For non-converging samplers, the image will continually change as more and more steps are used. These samplers have a lowercase a in their name, which stands for ancestral and means that they add noise back in during image generation. Since DPM Adaptive does not use steps, convergence is not applicable to it. Another important variable is how many steps are needed to get a decent looking output. Most samplers consistently get decent results within 20 steps, though there are some slow pokes like DPM Fast and PLMS, which need more than 30. In general, I'd say that even if you can get a decent image in 10 to 12 steps, you're still going to get a boost in quality by going up to 20 or 30. In these charts, I show the average and maximum steps I needed to get decent results with each sampler, out of a sample size of 9. Don't view these numbers as precise, because what constitutes a good image to me might not meet the cut for you, and the sample size is pretty small. But it should give you a ballpark idea for which samplers need the fewest steps. For most samplers, SDXL required slightly fewer steps to get a good result. However, Hewn was an exception to this and actually required more steps. However, just comparing steps isn't good enough because there are fast and slow samplers. So here's a comparison showing the results after adjusting for processing speed. In general, Keras samplers tended to be a bit faster than the non-Keras versions. While there are some slow pokes, most of the samplers fell within a relatively narrow range. Finally, let's talk about the most important parameter for samplers, which is, of course, the output image. Here's a chart showing which clusters of samplers resulted in similar outputs. There are three main groups with two outliers. This part is going to be a little different because I'll be discussing each group in detail to help you identify which samplers are best for you. Group 1 is the largest group and contains 11 of the 22 samplers. 
For subgroup B, the three samplers with Keras in the name can occasionally result in different outputs than the others. DDIM is unique within group 1 because it can have either output. UniPC is also unique because it has settings you can adjust, which I'll discuss in the advanced section of this video. All the group 1 samplers converge, and most do so in less than 20 steps, with a couple exceptions. Since there are so many samplers in group 1, how do we decide which ones are best? It's tricky, but there are a couple with noticeable downsides. First, DPM2 and DPM2 Keras have slow processing speeds compared to their sibling DPM++2M and DPM++2M Keras. Hewn is another slow sampler in group 1. While these three have slightly lower step requirements, it doesn't make up for requiring twice as much processing time per step. LMS and PLMS usually need more than 30 steps to get good results, so they're also slower than the others. UniPC is unique, and we'll talk about it later, but for your average user, you probably have better options. LMS cares can lose image quality at very high steps. However, there is no reason to use more than 50 steps on a Group 1 sampler, so it's not much of a downside. So that leaves four Group 1 samplers which perform roughly the same. Honestly, there isn't a definitive best pick among Group 1. I would say run some grids and pick out a couple you like. My personal pick is DPM++ 2M Keras from Group 1B. DDIM also had unique characteristics which make it worth using that we'll discuss in the advanced section of the video. Next, we have the five Group 2 samplers which all have a lowercase a in the name, which means ancestral, and that they add noise back in during generation. Once again, there are two subgroups with the care samplers sometimes resulting in different output. Euler A can match either set or just do its own thing. All of these samplers do not converge, which means the image will keep changing as you add more and more steps. Among these, I would say that Euler A is my top pick for SD 1.5, because it has faster processing speed with relatively low steps needed. The other four samplers all have slow processing speed. However, for SDXL, Euler A images don't look as sharp as the others, so I would go with DPM++2SA or DPM++2SA Keras. DPM2A and DPM2A Keras are both slow and need more steps, so that slows down their overall generation speed compared to the others. I would not recommend using them. Group 3 includes any sampler with SDE in the name and produces unique outputs compared to the other groups. Interestingly, they seem to be between Group 1 and Group 2 in terms of convergence. That means you can change the image at higher steps, but the change is generally less drastic than the Group 2 samplers. Since my original video, Group 3 got two new samplers, DPM++2M SDE and DPM++2M SDE Keras. The key difference is that the two original samplers have slow processing speed, while the two new ones have fast processing speed. Does that mean that they're better than the two original ones? Well, it's split. For DPM++2M SDE, it takes a lot more steps to get a decent output, sometimes more than 50 steps. Since you need more than twice as many steps to get a good output, it negates the advantage of faster processing speed. On the other hand, while DPM++2M SDE Keras requires more steps than the old Group 3 samplers, it's not quite double. At 20 steps, you can make a case for any of these three, but at 30 steps and above, DPM++2M SDE Keras is the clear winner. Our first outlier is DPM Adaptive. While I classify this one as unique, the results are usually pretty close to the Group 2 samplers. What makes this one unique is that it uses CFG instead of steps as its primary variable. Changing CFG changes the contrast and saturation of the image like it does for other samplers, but will rarely fry the image. Overall, the output quality is generally pretty good. The downside is that processing time is very long. Here's a chart showing how long it takes to generate 1024 by 1024 images with DPM Adaptive. There are slight differences in results between SDXL and SD 1.5. For SD 1.5, Generating one DPM adaptive image at 7 CFG took time equivalent to 100 steps. SDXL was a bit faster, generating one image at 7 CFG in time equivalent to 70 steps. In both cases, 
you could have generated at least three images with a fast sampler in the same time it takes for DPM Adaptive to generate one. As we know, getting the right output image from Stable Diffusion can be a numbers game. So generally, I prefer to generate several images and pick the best one rather than wait for DPM Adaptive to generate one. But that said, there's nothing wrong with it. And our final outlier sampler is DPM Fast. DPM Fast is basically the that guy of Stable Fusion samplers. It's always hanging around, but not really good for much. It does have a unique output, but that's really its only selling point. DPM Fast is a very sensitive to CFG and needs more than 30 steps to get decent results at the default CFG F7. If you use lower CFG, you can get decent results faster, but overall, I don't think it's worth using. Now we've finished up with the basics and are moving on to more advanced topics. Specifically, all those sigmas and etas in the settings tab. First, let's cover eta. By default, ancestral samplers have an eta of 1, while DDIM has an eta of 0. Eta measures how much noise is added back into the latent image after each step. As you might recall, this determines whether the output converges to a particular image or just keeps changing. Here are some examples showing how DDIM and some ancestral samplers behave at the same eta. As you can see, the output is pretty similar for each eta value. So, setting eta to zero turns the group two ancestral samplers into group one, and setting DDIM eta to one turns it into a group two sampler, on par with Euler A. Since we already have 11 group one samplers, keeping DDIM as group one has limited value. What might interest you instead is setting DDIM eta to 0.5 and using it as an intermediate between group one and group two. Unfortunately, you can't change eta for individual group 2 samplers, so it's all or nothing, which limits its usefulness to me at least. Now let's talk about the advanced settings for the UniPC sampler. As a short intro, UniPC stands for Unified Corrector and Predictor, and it can only be used for text-to-image, so DDIM will be used for the second pass of Hi-Res Fix. The most important variable for UniPC is order. Order has a default value of 3 and impacts the number of steps you need. Orders higher than 5 don't seem to be able to get good results at all. As order decreases, you need fewer and fewer steps. By setting order at 1, I can usually get good results within 10 steps compared to over 20 steps at an order of 3. To be upfront, most people aren't going to find it worthwhile to mess with the rest of the UniPC settings. But since you're here, let's dig into it. There are three variants for UniPC, BH1, BH2, and very underscore coef. Among these, very coef seem to be the most different, but they are all quite similar. Additionally, the three skip types for UniPC are time uniform, time quadratic, and log SNR. These seem to impact the steps needed a little bit, but the default value, time uniform, seems to be the best for low steps. Overall, I didn't see any compelling reason to change the variant or skip type, but if I missed something, let me know in the comments below. However, you might consider lowering order to 1 or 2 if you want to use UniPC for low step generation. Next, let's move on to the sigmas. And I'm not talking about those people who are obsessed with that chinless dude. There are two sets of sigma variables. The first set highlighted here only works on a grand total of four samplers, Euler, Hune, DPM2, and DPM2 Keras. This set includes Sigma Churn, Sigma Tmin, and Sigma Noise. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like Sigma Tmin can be used with XY plot, so it's really just Sigma Noise and Sigma Churn. Sigma Churn is by far the more interesting of the two. As you increase Sigma Churn, the output image gradually becomes more and more simple, though this comes at the expense of starting to look fuzzy. However, this effect is not very noticeable at the default Sigma Noise of 1. By itself, Sigma noise does absolutely nothing. Its only purpose seems to be modifying the impact of sigma churn. As sigma noise decreases, sigma churn has more and more impact. However, it is possible to go too far and the image turns into a blurry mess. If you want to play with this feature, I would recommend keeping sigma noise between 0.4 and 0.75 to get a balance between changes and not turn it into a blurry mess. Also, SDXL seems to be more impacted by sigma churn than SD1.5. 
Finally, we're moving on to the scheduler, along with minimum sigma, maximum sigma, and rho. None of these settings have any impact while scheduler is set to automatic. Additionally, these settings do not work at all for a couple samplers, DPM Adaptive, UniPC, DDIM, PLMS, and Hune. The scheduler has three options, Keras, Exponential, and Polyexponential. For samplers with Keras in their name, setting scheduler to Keras will yield the exact same results. For non-Keras samplers with a Keras version, setting scheduler to Keras will turn it into the Keras version. The non-Keras samplers seem similar to Exponential and Polyexponential, but not exactly the same. Next up is Minimum Sigma, which has a default value around 0.03. If you increase this value, the images gradually lose their sharpness and eventually become a blurry mess. Overall, I think it's best to leave this one as is. On the other hand, Maximum Sigma is pretty interesting. It acts as a brightness slider, with higher values resulting in darker images and lower values resulting in brighter images. However, it seems that increasing this too much can result in artifacts occasionally appearing. Finally, Rho. The impact of Rho depends on which scheduler is used. The exponential scheduler does not seem to be impacted by Rho at all. The default value for Keras is 7, but Keras seems to be pretty flexible in either direction unless you go pretty far. Finally, Poly exponential is very sensitive to Rho. At 20 steps, values as low as 3 will completely ruin the image. This can be mitigated by using more steps, though I'm not sure why you'd want to. And that wraps up the advanced settings. If this video taught you everything you wanted to know about samplers, like and subscribe to support the channel. If you really like these videos, consider supporting me by joining my Patreon, where you can view ad-free versions of all these videos. As always, thank you for watching, and see you next time.